next presentation and the last one before the lunch break. At least as it's a name I can pronounce. Um, Jaap Bouwman. He's an ecologist at the uh, Crown Estate at the law, at law. Um, and he is also the co-author of the 2015 update on the Orthoptera uh, grasshopper farm of the Netherlands. And uh, now today he's going to tell us more about the possibilities of DNA meta barcoding office to assess the food preferences of two species of grasshoppers. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for this uh, introduction. There's only one presentation between this moment and lunch, and it's going to be about food. So everybody stay quiet. I will try to talk very fast, so we get to the lunch uh, very fast. Uh, it looks uh, a very difficult, difficult title about DNA barcoding, and it is a bit difficult, but the most difficult part uh, is going to be told by Kees van Bochhoven, so I'm off the hook, more or less. Um, and uh, the part in the beginning is mainly about grasshopper shit, so it's quite fun. Uh, the main question is, can we use DNA techniques to unravel grasshopper uh, diets? So let's see if something like that can happen. We looked at mainly three species, but one of them is still, uh, uh, the, the, the scats are still in the freezer, so uh, we have no data about them. Uh, the one uh, left up is uh, Tetrix beeping tata, and the one down is Ephipha diurnus. The other one is Gamsekleis uh, glabra. Of these three species, we uh, collected scats uh, to see if we can use DNA barcoding to, uh, to, to look what they've been eating. Uh, these are the research uh, locations, it's mainly the Veluwe. Uh, uh, Jeroen van Leeuwen also said about his presentation about Ephipha diurnus, that the Veluwe is, is the main area of this species, uh, and it's also the area where Gamtokleis glabra is present, and also Tetrix uh, bipunctata, but uh, from especially Tetrix bipunctata we have only one location, uh, so we need another location, so we went to the eastern parts of uh, Berlin uh, to collect some scats there as well. This is one of the research areas, it's a big military area called uh, the Oldenbroekse Heide, it's, uh, it's a very big area, it's still in use, as you can see, uh, with big tanks, and they, they shoot on them with a uh, big grenade, so it's very safe uh, field work there. Uh, you should stay on the paths and, and have, have a good look before you go into the heatlands, because there are just munition ever, everywhere there. But it is a very nice spot uh, with a big population of Ephippige diurnus, but also Gamsokleis glabra there. This is the only location of uh, Tetrix bipunctata in the Netherlands, as far as we know. It's a spot of about, I think, well, 5 by 5, 10 by 10, not more. And it's the only place where we can find them. Um, I've been there with Rob uh, to collect uh, the scats, and we needed about one and a half hour before we found the first one. So, and that's on a location where we know it's there. So, uh, that shows how difficult to find new places that this be for this particular species. This is a, a photo of the Trampa area, which is more or less alike. You see a lot of herbs there. It's close to, uh, to the forest edge, uh, a lot of open grounds, but especially a lot of herbs and uh, uh, flowers. So the field work, uh, this is again the location of uh, Tetrix bipunctata. Uh, where we did, uh, where I did the field work uh, together with uh, with uh, Rob, uh, and when you go in the field collecting scats, uh, you need a, a few things. You need some gloves because you don't want to uh, contaminate the uh, the scats. You need some clean uh, tubes uh, to to put them in, and then you can basically go on. This is the field work. On the right side, you see a, a lot of our German friends who, who helped us uh, with the field work uh, in Trampe. And on the left side, there's a picture you're going to see quite often because I've already seen this picture before in the presentation of, of, uh, of Roy. Uh, that's uh, Rob Felix on the ground on his knees. You can see, uh, you see it quite often. It's an, a normal sight in the Netherlands. So, and then it's quite easy because you put the grasshopper in a clean tube and then you wait in most times, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe half an hour, and, and then they will shit. Uh, this is uh, uh, Tetrix uh, bipunctata. 
who uh, with the two, two droppings, which were round of shape, I always expect, expected that all grasshopper scats would be elongated, but it's not true, but Petrix bibicata, they're round. So something we found out now as well. Um, and what we also did, we did, did not only collect the, uh, the adults, be, but we also tried to find out if there are differences between adults and nymphs. And that seemed a good idea, and it is in practice, but it's, it was quite difficult to, to find the nymphs, especially of Ephippiga diurnus on some locations, especially when the populations are very low. They were extremely hard uh, to find, but in the end we collected enough individuals to get enough scats to do the analysis. And then at the end of a day of field work, you've got a, a car trunk full of uh, small tubes with, uh, with grasshoppers in them. And uh, at the end, hopefully, they have all done their, their thing and you have enough scats to take home. And the good thing about this is that you can release the individuals after that and just take the scats home. Okay, I think now the more difficult part will come and I'll give the word to Kees. Um, well, then they arrive at the laboratory and yeah, you have to do some analysis on them. Um, that's where uh, 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 I came in. My name is Kees van Bochover. Um, and in the laboratory, we started with uh, the DNA extraction. So you end up with a, a, a vial with, with water, with the DNA dissolved in it. Um, we do a PCR. We do uh, the, uh, after that, um, we, we sequence the DNA and, and do some uh, data analysis on them. Um, well, the PCR is the, the critical part in the process. There you can decide what, what uh, markers, what part of the DNA you are looking into. Um, and we uh, uh, focused on uh, three markers, PRNL, which is a chloroplast marker. Uh, we used it to characterize what plants were eaten. Um, 16S, which is uh, a, a mitochondrial gene and is mostly used uh, for a characterization of the, uh, what invertebrates are there. And 18S, which is a nuclear gene, and we particularly looked into the uh, P7 uh, uh, region. Um, and, and that's used to, with, uh, to uh, like, it's a quite a universal uh, marker. And you can, uh, at the same analysis, look into fungi, but also algae. Um, in fact, all uh, eukaryotic, uh, eukaryotic organisms do have this gene. Uh, so you get a really broad idea of what, this, what the grasshoppers were eating. Um, well, interesting to know uh, is that we could only retrieve very short fragments, especially of the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, so it was not feasible to, to amplify, for instance, uh, CO1. You could retrieve some sequences, but most, uh, well, it, it was not, we were not able to, to get a, a full diversity uh, based on the CO1 gene. Um, and that was actually only fe uh, feasible uh, using the 18S marker, uh, which is a nuclear marker, probably because it's located inside the nucleus and thereby more protected from de uh, degradation. Um, well, the DNA, the lab work was uh, done in an, a laboratory which is dedicated to uh, working with samples that contain a low level of DNA. Um, and that's necessary because uh, otherwise you could easily contaminate your, your samples. So, um, yeah, you have to, to work in a really clean environment. Um, so, what do they eat? Um, we found uh, what we expected was maybe uh, Petrix, uh, maybe would eat uh, some mosses or maybe uh, LGA. Um, but what did we found, actually most of the DNA we could retrieve was uh, fungi. Um, so uh, both uh, basidiomycetes, ascomycetes, also several other groups as LJ, uh, but fungi, uh, fungi were, uh, yeah, was the, the biggest component of the, of the diet. Um, 
it could be both uh, it, it were both uh, 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 the fungi but also the uh, fungi that are represented in uh, um, uh, light genes so. um, well then the results about the uh, uh, fipiger um, we looked into the difference in the sexes, and um, actually there was only a difference between uh, a st statistical difference. Well, let's let's maybe start with uh, explaining uh, explaining a bit more the the, the graph. Um, on the uh, y-axis, you can see the fraction of the diet, and that's based on the DNA. So the fraction of the DNA that's uh, 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 yeah, from, from a certain group of species. Um, and, well, the, the, the uh, Fipiger shows a more varied uh, diet, and also uh, plants were eaten uh, uh, yeah, regularly, um, and as well as uh, metazoa. So that's mostly represented by invertebrates in this, uh, in this uh, study. Um, a big, uh, the, uh, the only significant difference is if you look into the different uh, sexes was were found in the harsh camp, um, where, we, where um, um, uh, females ate more fungi than the uh, male nymphs. Larger differences were uh, present if we looked into the differences between the two sides and, and the differences between the nymphs and the adults. Um, interestingly, and also understandably, um, uh, metazoa, so the invertebrates, were mostly eaten by the nymphs, probably because they need a more protein-rich uh, diet uh, to, to grow. Um, and also, um, there were differences between the, the amount of uh, uh, fungi that were eaten versus uh, uh, plants. So at the harsh camp, um, statistically, more uh, 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 plants were eaten compared to fungi in, uh, at the harsh camp. Um, well, then we zoomed into the, the plants um, to see uh, what, what uh, different plants are eaten by, by, the, by the, the grasshoppers. Um, first, again, the differences uh, in, uh, between the sexes. Um, the only significant difference that we found was between um, uh, in the herbs, the con consumption of the herbs where uh, at the harsh camp uh, um, the, the, uh, the, the females ate more herbs than the males. Um, well, um, also uh, when we look into the, the, the uh, uh, more of the details, uh, interesting is here that um, more herbs were eaten uh, by the by the nymphs, um, and um, yeah, and especially at at the older brook, uh, less uh, heather was eaten. So they really switched there to the herbs instead of eating uh, heather. Well, some of the uh, more the methodological conclusions. Um, well, first, it did indeed uh, offer some insights in the diet of of the grasshoppers, um, and but uh, you need to take into account that there is a lot of uh, differences between uh, samples. So there is a high standard deviation. So you need quite some samples to get statistical significant results. Um, and also interesting is that the, the DNA. Uh, in the in the droplings is highly degraded, so yeah, you can only look into really short fragments, and that that limits your your taxonomical re, uh, re, uh, resolution. And then Jaap will uh, tell some conclusions about the ecological part. And I already saw Luke saying two two minutes, so he's going to be a bit strong now. Um, ecological ecological Conclusions, uh, I can be very quick because uh, a case already uh, showed some things, um, but I, they are preliminary and we need more, uh, more data to sustain them and a lot of more research, but it seems that the, the nymphs prefer more mineral uh, rich food. Uh, this 
pattern is best shown at, at Harskamp. Uh, and the Ob in, in Oldenbroek, which is a far better area for Eetwebbiger, it is uh, less pronounced. The Oldenbroek population show a rich diet with more herbs and, and, and less heather, which we, we thought at the beginning they would eat a lot of heather, but they seem to prefer other, other herbs. And at the Harskamp population, adult males eat more woody plants and less heather. Uh, so maybe this will affect the, the nuptial gift. It's also something we would like to uh, look into. For the research, uh, we still have got a lot of scats of gamsoclais in the freezer, which we need to analyze, but we need some f to get some funding from anybody who thinks, well, let's start looking at grasshopper shit. Um, uh, 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 sampling more tetrix would be nice because we have only uh, from two locations and on those locations also not, uh, not a lot of uh, scats. And we can do some more detailed analysis uh, to see uh, why they prefer fungi or even metazoa on one location and not on the other location. Uh, final conclusion, the DNA meta barcoding is an interesting uh, way of looking at things. It's a new way of looking at things, and it can be promising, but uh, we need more sampling and we need more fine-tuning to draw some final conclusion about this matter. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. I'm sorry to keep you on a short leash. Um, questions? Thanks, uh, Oliver Havlicek again. Uh, I have a question on the methods. So you said that you only retrieved very short fragments. So what, what size did you retrieve that you could actually analyze? My first question, and did, you, did I understand that right, that you got shorter fragment, or the fragments of C1 were shorter than of the other mitochondrial markers too? Is that right? Yeah, most likely, because of C1 we were not able to uh, well, we did retrieve only few, few sequences. Um, we did use uh, a 16S marker, which is about 60 base pair, and that was feasible. But then your taxonomic resolution is very uh, limited. And the TRNL marker, this plant marker, is a short marker, but it does uh, allow for quite some, uh, quite a good taxonomic resolution, which was also about 50, 60 base uh, base pair. So. That's it really, really small, yeah. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? You're all hungry? <laughs> nobody on the, on the chat? Uh, no. Okay, uh, thanks very much.